Hello and welcome to another edition of Agenda 2063 TV show, a show where we focus on developments around the African Union institutions. But although even though we are focusing this series on the African continental free trade area, we still feel it is important to have discussions that relate to COVID and everything related to Agenda 2063, for which reason we have a very important guest to help do that today in our show. But of, of course, as usual, we'll be having uh, segments. We have the APRM Watch and we'll have the Ear on East Africa. My name is Emmanuel K. Benson Jr. I'm your regular host for this show. We'll be right back. It was really good at memorizing and all of that, but I, I saw that it didn't really help me in real life. So this is the right place for me because these are the skills that I want to get in this age that I'm currently at. I feel lucky because I always wanted to travel around the world, but that seems to be sometimes hard. And this place brings the majority, like the totality of the continent in here. And I feel lucky for that because it give, brings you more opportunity, more insight, more culture, more understanding for other people. Early Rwanda has definitely been community. Um, just learning to be there for other people and allow people to be there for you even when it seem stuff that has been a big lesson for me and I feel that this is the one thing that I would definitely love to carry home to always not judge people and just be open for people be around be there simply so welcome back from the break and welcome to the APRM watch um, where we give you insights into developments around the Africa peer review mechanism as you will know by now the Africa peer Re review mechanism I explained last week started right here in Ghana uh, Ghana was one of the first countries to start in 2003. We haven't been so great on following it, but uh, hopefully the guys down in Midrand uh, at the Secretariat are trying to push uh, Ghana to make sure that they do the right thing and do the needful. 2023 is the key date for APRM because by that time they want all member states to have acceded. Uh, that is to say that at least they would have put themselves up for peer review. It is important this peer review because that is what will allow us to know how well we are doing in each member state, what we can you know, do better and so on and so forth. The pace is quite slow for now. There are less than, we have 55 member states of the AU and um, less than half of those member states uh, have acceded to the APRM, but the progress is still underway. But some of us are wondering whether 2023 will meet it, but we'll do our best to make sure that we still keep the advocacy uh, on it. You see, for example, the APRM is important because in 2008 it predicted the violence in Kenya, it predicted the xenophobia in South Africa, uh, and for which reason it is positioning itself well to make sure that it serves as an early warning conflict mechanism as well to support the AU Peace and Security Department and also the silence in the guns that we've been talking about uh, around the uh, AU. So in that respect, we need to support it as best we can. Kenya, for example, is one of the countries that is domesticating APRM uh, in, in its counties. In Ghana, we call them regions. They have uh, counties. And imagine if in Ghana we had you know, APRM in uh, the uh, in, in the different regions and looking at the parameters, domesticating it to that level. We're praying that we'll get to that uh, stage, but in Ghana we like to pray a lot and we need to do more than pray. We need to follow the Kenyan way and make sure that we take it to legislation uh, where we can actually start focusing on how, how it makes sense uh, to look at democracy through those particular uh, parameters. Now finally, under APR and March, um, some member states are looking at a regional strategy to deal with APRM. One of those uh, regions is the IGAD, the Intergovernmental Authority uh, on Development, uh, which is uh, in East Africa, six member states. It includes Ethiopia, Kenya, Djibouti, Eritrea, and Somalia. Uh, they want a regional strategy on APRM because they feel that it would better suit them. IGAD, in my personal view, is like the ECOWAS of East Africa because it has been learning a lot from ECOWAS on how to do peace and conflict. And there's a lot of conflict in the Horn of Africa uh, in that region and, and so it feels that it needs to build and augment its capacity on, uh, on, on peace and security. So for them, a regional strategy is good and so they're in talks with APRM to ensure that 
uh, that happens. So thank you very much for gracing us uh, with, your, with your time uh, for this APRM watch. We'll have some more uh, in-depth discussions for you uh, in the next time. Thank you. So welcome back from the break. And as usual, I'm always very excited to be talking about East Africa, uh, here in East Africa, uh, the third edition, where today we're just taking a look at some of the developments that are happening um, around the region and uh, what are some of the issues that are dominating the region. There's some, when you take a look at Twitter, there's some uh, quite worrying developments. For example, locusts. Locusts were supposed to be coming from East Africa to West Africa. Thankfully, we have not had that issue where, <laughs> uh, with all that we are dealing with with COVID, we also have to deal with locusts. Uh, I think they were stopped in their tracks somehow. We don't know how, but they, they are in East Africa, and uh, it's a problem that they have to deal with. We understand from what we've been reading on the Twitter feed that between 16 and 31st July, East Africa is going to be experiencing a lot of desert locusts, and that will be eating the crops and so on. There's going to be uh, some problems there that they need to take care of. It's going to be affecting their food security, of course. Briefly on uh, COVID, uh, East Africa is kind of in the middle as far as uh, mortalities are concerned. Uh, there have been 54,714 cases. Thankfully, not mortalities, but cases, um, as compared to 107,869 cases in West Africa. So clearly, um, we have a lot more cases in this part of the, of the, of the world. Um, they are still developing their strategies on how to deal with it, because in East Africa, they also have the peculiar case where they're dealing with truck drivers that are moving along the roads and which they needed to quarantine some of them um, to make sure that they don't spill it over into other uh, bordering countries. There's also flash flooding. Uh, so you have the locusts, so you have flash flooding that is happening. Uh, in East Africa, where it's just out of the blue, just rains, and then it's raining for, for, for uh, hours. But some, someone rightly said on Twitter that, um, put it this way, that there's a quadruple dilemma in East Africa right now. So there's floods, there's COVID, there's conflict, and there's locusts. In fact, all of that is also happening in West Africa, uh, minus the locusts. We have Boko Haram in addition, and we also have Sahel. So in fact, ours is probably five or six problems. So um, we are still reigning as far as uh, challenges and problems are concerned in West Africa. Uh, but all of these clearly in East Africa is, it does not all go well for them because it threatens their food security. It makes things more expensive. And uh, we pray that they also uh, work on that with the uh, member states. But some reports from the African Development Bank, for example, are saying that because of COVID, uh, East Africa now is moving uh, from an uh, agric services to more service sector, which in many ways is good. The services sector is proven to be very useful for any region uh, and uh, makes more money, it's more profitable. Uh, but nonetheless, at the end of the day, Africa is still an agricultural continent. We, need, we have a lot of uh, food here and we still need to be able to sell the food that we make. COVID's impact is not helping and it's not, definitely not helping the East Africa region. But for next week, we'll be able to give you a lot more positive stories uh, on developments in East Africa, maybe a little bit of education on, on uh, what is happening in specific countries as well. We'll be right back. So welcome back from the break. And uh, Joanna, it's nice to have you. It's good to see you after so long. Yeah, uh, you've been doing some very great work on uh, drug policy. and. Mm -hmm. The reason why we brought you here is because COVID is lingering among us. We will have to deal with it for a long time. But there's also the very important issue of drug policy reform, which you have been doing a lot of advocacy on for uh, a number of years now. Tell us a little bit about what the Drug Policy Network, it used to be called West Africa Drug Policy. Mm -hmm. But in the five years that it started, it started in 2015 and in 2020, a lot of ups and downs, ups and downs. Maybe you can tell us, first of all, what Drug Policy Network is, what it does, then we'll move all over on to uh, why, in your view, um, it's important to follow that network uh, and take a look at some of the developments around drug policy. Okay. Thank you mm. for having me here, 
Ima. It's been a while. Yes. 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 So, Thank you. West Africa Drug Policy Network, as it was called, yeah. uh, it's, um, a, a, for lack of a better word, um, a joint collaboration between different networks okay. and passionate youth groups okay. to fight uh, to champion the cause of drug policy, mm -hmm. fight against inhumane drug policies as they met it out on problematic drug users. Mm -hmm. uh, when we started, we started off with you were uh, you as a member, you still is an active member, mm -hmm. uh, Maria Goretti and mm -hmm. uh, Adamu and some few mm -hmm. other people where we were trying to change the policies of drug policies mm -hmm. in West Africa, yes. from Nigeria, Ghana, Sierra Leone, trying to change the narrative. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were lucky to have Obasanjo, um, the late Kofi Annan, also championing the same cause. And that mm -hmm. led to the intro introduction of the, um, not just in transit reports, mm -hmm. uh, giving mm -hmm. details on how to handle drug policy mm -hmm. situations in the West African region. Yes. And so over the five years span, we've been able to um, lead the forefront of discussions in Ghana, mm. uh, in other parts of the West African countries. Uh, in Ghana, which I've been actively involved, mm -hmm. we've been able to be at the forefront of the new law that was passed, giving way for um, punitive, less punitive approaches to pro problematic drug users, mm -hmm. and also um, leading for minimal you know, Sentences. sentences mm -hmm. for problematic drug users. Um, we've also been able to um, get young people actively involved in the discussion. We've been in, in, um, in talks with stakeholders like the NACOB, um, mm. having dialogues, um, educational programs for people to understand mm -hmm. why we have or we, we need a drug policy change. Mm -hmm in Ghana and in West Africa. I'm going to have to interrupt you. NACO being, of course, uh, uh, of course, a narcotics board mm -hmm. um, for, for, for Ghana. But I'm also going to be a little bit more provocative because some will say that you've been able to engage uh, the narcotics control board, which is an important stakeholder in this advocacy. Uh, but a lot of people will say people have a choice to take drugs or not to take drugs. If they choose to take drugs, is there a problem? If they want to use needles, they want to harm themselves, why not just let them, law enforcement, just lock them away because they're a nuisance. They'll come and steal families' belongings and go and sell it to take more drugs. Why not just leave it That's like that? That's the problem. Yeah. That's the problem. That's the mindset we've created. Yeah. Drug users are not criminals. Okay, but some will say that they are they because are. Some will the say big fish is feeding them, some and they say take it. Some will say they yeah. are because they, they take drugs, yes. okay? But we had a tagline saying drug users are not criminals. Mm. And here is why. Mm. They need to be showed love and care and support. Mm. But if I'm using drugs mm. and I'm in my family and mm. I'm not regarded as a human being, yeah. of course, I'll go to the streets where I'll be appreciated by people of the same kind. Mm -hmm. And I need to survive. Yeah. How do I survive? Nobody wants to employ me. Of course, I'll pickpocket and, and try and make something for myself and get something to eat. Mm -hmm. Why would you criminalize a trafficker and criminalize the user? Yeah. The trafficker is making the drugs available for the user. Mm. So who should we go after? The trafficker. So therein lies the argument that it is the big fish that law but, enforcement but, must but tackle. Big f yeah. The law enforcement <laughs> is not ta targeting the big fish. Yeah. Rather, they are targeting the users. Yeah. There are so many people in jail mm. who are in jail because of minor offenses of possessing one strip of marijuana mm. or being found with a group of people who use drugs. Mm. And mm. drug issue has become a criminal you know, system issue because we've made it so. Yeah. But it's supposed to be a health issue. Yeah. It's actually uh, supposed to be an issue tackled by the health sector mm. where we have rehabilitation sectors and then we put problematic drug users. We call them prob problematic drug users because if you call them drug addicts, it's mm -hmm. stigmatizing. Yeah. You put problematic drug users in there, mm -hmm. you help them out of their addiction, and you integrate them back into the society. Yeah. You first of all reduce the, the rate of crime in the country mm -hmm. because you've helped them out of their addiction. Mm -hmm. You've reintegrated them back by giving them some level of training mm. in terms of vocational training, etc., so they come out and they get something to do for themselves. 
Okay. You are able to educate families to show love and support to them. Mm. Yeah. So that is more like a disease. Okay. Drug addiction is like a disease, okay. which requires a mental health and some care psychology too. As a, and add a little bit of mm. psychology to it. Yeah. But if you add a bit of criminal, you know, mm -hmm. system to it, they become hardened criminals. Because I go to prison, after all, it's just one strip of my wife. They still get access to the drugs in prison anyway. Mm -hmm. In your view, why has it taken so long for this mindset to change? Is it just because it's easy for governments to throw, throw the users in jail? Is it, is it just, oh, we have, you know, business of elections, business of trying to get votes to this year, that year? Is, is it because of that? That's why we've had this issue. I will say it is and it's not. Okay. Um, the late Kofi Annan said, mm. um, may he so rest in peace. Drugs mm. have harmed many, mm. but bad policies have harmed many more. Yeah. It's, first of all, as a result of bad policies. Yeah. Second, as a result of the I don't care factor. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, we don't care if you take the drugs, but we'll put you in jail. Yeah. But what we forget is that it takes um, the government to feed each person. Okay. I think each person uh, is, is, is being given 1.4, 1 CD 40 pesos. Yeah, 1 okay. CD 40 pesos a day. Wow. Okay. For breakfast lunch and supper what can that do yes <laughs> breakfast lunch and supper one city 40 pesos a day Eesh. now if it's more expensive mm. to incarcerate a mm. person mm. and less expensive to put the person into rehabilitation okay let's take it this way we we, we get the person we send the person into rehabilitation and there are a lot of filth on our streets. Why don't we let them clean to save us, you know, a, yes. a, you know, a warning to others? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You are not only reducing or, or decongesting the, the prison present. service, mm -hmm. you are also cleaning our roads. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you let them do other things. You let them do them other things. To take mind away but from it's, it's just that prison. our focus is on the fact that drug use is a criminal justice system issue. Mm -hmm. Drug users are criminals. So it's the mindset. Yeah. And the lack of indiscipline on our path mm. as a people, yes. you know, mm -hmm. we don't care. So for us, you know, it's within the criminal system, then everybody who uses drugs is a criminal. Mm. So we see them and, you know, we all try to hide away or shy away from them. Yeah. That's why in many ways it's interesting how uh, important uh, the stakeholder of um, NACOP has been, which is now, of course, the Narcotics Control Commission. Commission. Tell us a little bit about that, because I'm sure it was not easy trying to engage them, being what they are. They are yeah, law enforcement, strict. more criminal justice. <laughs> so to approach them as a you know, civil society organization trying to reform drug policy, surely we must have encountered some challenges. Okay, lucky for us, we have mm. a firm advocate of a, mm. a new policy that mm. seeks to support and not punish drug users, yeah. support drug users to rehabilitation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. through education, through health, you know, services. And that was Mr. Akrasi Asapon, who was the former secretary yeah. to, the, to the commission. Yeah. The, by then it was NACOP, the, yeah. the NACOP. Mm -hmm. And he has really been of great help because he believed mm -hmm. in the fact that we need to have a new policy system that seeks to support problematic drug users mm -hmm. and not criminalized drug users. Mm -hmm. He believed in our policies. He believed in the vision of okay. the network. Mm -hmm. And he has been there for years. He's mm -hmm. come into contact with them. So yeah. he understands the job on the ground. Yeah. He understands what will work and what will not work. Mm -hmm. So we decided to, you know, tap into his knowledge, his expertise and his ideas, mm -hmm. and then push forward for a, a, a new, you know, change as mm -hmm. far as drug policy discussion is concerned yeah. of course it had not been easy yes. you go and you meet people and then you know they, they don't believe in it they have you know Ghanaians are yeah, very they're trying to influence them to change you yeah. know Ghanaians are very <laughs> crave so yeah. you meet people who are so crave yeah. there to yeah. a point and then they look at you like why are you trafficking drug are yeah. you also I've I've had people ask me if I use drugs a yeah. couple of times yeah. I remember when we we're having one of the stakeholders discussion at parliament mm. we had one person who was really against us yeah and he's he's a knuckle wow okay he was against us he was against the whole idea of harm reduction the whole I idea of 
alternative punitive approach towards the whole discussion. Mm -hmm. That's because his mindset in his mind mm. is a criminal system issue. So whoever yeah. talks about drugs, yeah. illicit drug use mm -hmm. has you know, a link to that. Yeah. So it's not been easy, but we've been able to educate people, we've been able to change the narrative, we've been able to have a more clear discussion mm -hmm. as far as drug policy is concerned. Yeah. So that's one thing I will commend the network for. It has not been easy. You wake up at dawn, you know, to brainstorm, to research, yeah. just so you get your facts. Because yeah. Ghanaians want facts, they want yeah. research. Yes. So yeah. you go and they ask you, where in has, has, there, has it been written? Where is your research backing your claims? And you have to prove to them yeah. that it is there. Mm. Just that we've not really taken it's serious. So it's really been a battle back and forth. But, you know, we've had an understanding, yeah. you know, for now, there's been an understanding that we need to look at the policy system. And that was how come we're able to change some of the policies. And that was what was passed into law. And people were just jubilating and making a whole noise about it. Uh, some few months ago. And of course, it was passed into law before COVID before really Before COVID hit. even so, came in. So imagine, so I'm just wondering, I couldn't help but wonder, reading through the history, just, so what would have happened if it had happened, you know, um, this, this law had gone to the stage where COVID was becoming as big as the cases have been now? Yeah. Do you, in your view, do you think it would have, you know, moved the extent to which it has moved? It would not. It would not, and even now is not, yeah. because we have mm. the prison sector very congested yeah. with people who have minor offenses still in prison. Mm -hmm. And just like I said, they are being fed on one CD 40 pesos a day. Yes. So yes. if COVID should hit the prisons, yeah. how are they going to survive? Okay. Yeah. If yeah. COVID should hit the prisons, mm. how would they survive on one CD 40 pesos a day? Yeah. So if that had not been put in place, I feel or believe would have had serious issues on mm. our hands that mm. would not be able to have sorted or solved. Yeah. You know. So I think at, the, at that stage, we're going to take a break in a minute. We'll, we'll return to this very important discussion. We'll be right back. Yeah, I feel like ALU was the school destined for me. I've always known about the state of the continent from a very theoretical standpoint. And uh, I feel like ALU is the school that was going to offer a unique perspective and unique understanding of the state of the continent as it is now. Coming from Ethiopia and also coming from straight from high school and to get this quality education, world class education, that's why I feel really lucky to be part of uh, LU. Now that I'm finally here, I get the opportunity to specialize and understand certain aspects of the continent, like education, urbanization, job creation and the likes. I'm really excited to be here because I finally get the opportunity to not only get all these things from a theoretical broad standpoint, but then to narrow all these things down to what exactly needs to be done for the benefit of the continent. Finding yourself in um, a diverse community of around 38 countries is quite um, interesting. I personally love it, I enjoy it. When you read on the logo where they say we do hard things, it's actually true. You're not going to be disappointed. To me, gradually, I'll say ALU was a dream come true. Coming to ALU was so unexpected. For me, it was like a dream come true, like something unexpected, but I feel like I'm in the right place. So welcome back from the break. We have in the studio Joanna Boateng. He was a member of the Drug Policy Network Ghana, explaining to us why drug reform policy is very important in this whole conversation um, in Ghana and in fact around the whole agenda 2063 because a lot of developments around health are coming uh, and we need to be able to situate the different parts of, um, of health, COVID, drug policy, uh, this whole thing about Africa Medicines Agency which is coming which we will not have time to discuss in today's show, but it's an important reference to make that developments, uh, Africa CDC, Africa Medicines Agency are just two AU institutions that are part of the health agenda when it comes to Agenda 2063. But right now we're discussing this whole issue with COVID, uh, whether COVID um, is going to threaten the development of uh, the drug policy reform that they've been able to chalk, or the success that they've been able to chalk uh, under the Drug Policy Network. So I'm going to put that to you. Um, the bill has been passed. We now have a narcotics 
Control Commission. Mm -hmm. It's been around for how many months now? Uh, uh, I think a couple of months. I've a couple really of months now. Uh, so which means it's, it's a now a commission that has mm -hmm. teeth, yeah. there'll be commissioners and they'll be able to have more, I guess, yeah, more prosecutorial yeah, prosecutor, role yeah. and so on, which is great. But then um, how will that impact the great work that you've been able to do, especially because COVID, a lot of resources are now obviously being pumped into, yeah. into COVID. Is it going, in your view, what do we need to do to make sure it does not lie dormant and we still put the pressure? On, on, on drug policy reform. Okay, so I think um, mm. it's not going to be dormant because mm. there's still some work being done by okay. the network behind okay. closed doors. Okay. Um, there's still discussion. Okay. We are trying to lead the discussion on the harm reduction okay. just so we would be able to reduce the level of infection among okay. PWIDs, that's the people who inject drugs. Okay. Um, so there's been a lot of high increase with PWIDs as far as HIV is, is concerned. Yes. And the recent World Drugs Report states that 14.9 million people in the world yeah. have HIV, with wow. 19 point, I think two or so people having HIV in Africa. Wow. So if we are able to divert our strength, mm. our attention towards harm reduction, yeah. we'll be able to reduce the level of spread mm -hmm. of HIV among PWIDs. Okay. I like what you're saying about HIV in particular, because I remember when COVID hit, a lot of people were saying, well, the way people are making noise about COVID is like when HIV started, yes, started 20 years ago, a lot of people were scared and now we are living with it. We are living, we can take drugs and, you know, it can, you know, the drugs can help. So that discussion is important because here we have a pandemic in COVID and then we have an endemic disease um, in HIV. HIV. In your view, um, what do we still need to do to make sure that people understand that this HIV is still as important to, you know, tackle it and get rid of it as much as we can, even though we are living in it. We, we've been living with it for over 20 years it's over. Uh, and we, we, we manage it. But still, people need to understand that if we are able to follow this harm reduction mm -hmm. and reduce the spread of HIV infection, mm -hmm. then that will also help free resources in the health budget to make sure that it, it tackles other diseases. other diseases. What do you need to quickly do to make sure people understand that kind of logic? I think earlier on we yeah. were having a discussion yeah. similar to that on yeah. COVID, how yeah. attention has been diverted to COVID mm. and how everybody is focused on COVID. Yeah. Maybe because there's no vaccine, there's no mm -hmm. cure, there's, it's, it's yeah. more or less like airborne now, yeah. as we are being told, yes. and we are not in normal times yeah. our lives has halted for over six months yeah. we can't do anything yeah. that is why maybe the health sector is actually you know focused on it but that's wrong in yeah. a way yeah. because drug policy mm. will definitely contribute to the spread of COVID-19 yeah because people are still injecting people are still injecting uh, yeah and, and they're sharing and sharing means and sh there for you exactly uh, and yes. we live in a country yes. where there's too much indiscipline mm -hmm. yeah. There's too much indiscipline. Mm. We don't listen. Mm. We don't care. Mm. We enjoy the freedom that has been thrown to us. Mm. So I feel and I believe that we need to continue the, the media engagement. Yeah. The discussion should be more, the education should be more, because as it stands now, people still don't understand why we need to have drug policy change. Yeah. So mm. we need to change the mindset. We can even, you know, fuse it in yeah. into COVID. Yes. Mm. You know, we can fuse the discussion into the COVID-19 discussion where we educate people on COVID-19 and still bring in the drug policy discussion. We can also engage stakeholders to actually champion in resources into drug policy um, mm -hmm. discussion. Because mind you, HIV, AIDS, hepatitis B and cancer patients, mm. these are the three deadly diseases we all know. Mm. Although HIV is considered not a, a deadly disease mm. anymore yeah. because we have medication that is being given to people. Yeah. Now the um, medication given to um, the patients yeah. is free. No. It's free. It's being given by the Ministry of Health. Okay. It's free and it's even expensive. Mm. So are you waiting to get more people have, uh, to, to have more people mm -hmm. uh, contracting the HIV and AIDS and hepatitis B before you, you divert attention towards that end? Mm. No. We need to treat everything 
with as, um, as, as a matter of you know emergency. urgency yeah. we need to treat each of the uh, pandemic situations hiv is no more a pandemic issue yeah. i mean we have so many people living with hiv yeah. they've given birth they are breastfeeding they are mm. even healthier than you and i mm. so it's so no more a life-threatening disease. disease. So we've been but cancer, yeah. it, cancer is, cancer. Mm -hmm. and yet less attention is given to that sector because of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So I think there should be balance. Yes, clearly. We should create a balance. Whilst creating the balance, we need to engage with stakeholders, the health sector, mm -hmm. to find a way by which we can create that balance together. That's between the CSOs and then the health sector. CSOs have sort of going to sleep a bit mm. because of the COVID. We need to employ the use of the virtual yeah, um, spaces. spaces. Yeah. We need to engage people using the virtual opportunities that we have. Mm -hmm. Twitter is there. We can, you know, engage more young people on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Educate them using the Twitter space. Yes. We can use the Facebook space. We can still do advocacy towards that end. Mm -hmm. But it seems we've gone back to sleep because COVID has stopped or halted our way of thinking. But there's still more work to be done in that sector. And I guess also it could be argued, uh, none of us are medical doctors, but it could be argued that since the cases are increasing, it's important to have different conversations of what we need to do. But then we can also or, ask ourselves, yeah. why is the case, how? Yeah. What is contributing to the spikes in numbers? Yeah. Community spread, they say it's community spread. It's community spread, but then yeah. they keep saying, first it was, um, one meter, yeah. then it came to two meters, yeah. then it came to it being on something for a period of 24 hours, on surfaces for a period of 8 hours and 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Now it says it's airborne for yeah. 8 hours. Yeah. Meaning that everybody has COVID now. Yeah, <laughs> yes. We all have COVID now. Mm. But and we are asymptomatic, some of us are asymptomatic. That, that <laughs> word is what I don't even understand. <laughs> because at the end of the day, mm. it's still COVID-19. Mm. It's mm. still COVID-19. Yes. Whether you like it or not, I mean, my dad came one day and said, hey, I think I have COVID. I said, stay away. <laughs> because we engage with people yeah. all the time. Mm. We talk to people all the time. Mm. So the fact that it's now airborne, it means that we all have it. Mm. So let's channel other resources and our attention towards other cases. Mm. So after COVID-19, then you have increase in HIV and AIDS, increase in hepatitis B infections, increase in cancer rates mm. or levels and then you what coming you, you are now coming back to channel resources into curbing it yeah. and fighting against it when you, no. should, you could be you could have been talking about it at the we same can time. curb it at the same time yeah yeah because no matter what Ghanaians will not stay in the house yeah the use of nose max mm. it gets to a point where it's frustrating yeah i got to the entrance oh, jesus i forgot my nose max mm. so mm. i mean COVID is COVID. it's come it's going to stay mm. Whether it will stay or it will not stay, we can't determine it. Because yeah. I believe it's come before. Yeah. And it's come now. Mm. 2020 came with its own force. Yeah. So we need to manage that force it came with. Mm. That doesn't mean that we should throw away other important discussions on somewhere mm. and focus more on COVID-19. So post-COVID-19, yeah. what are we going to do? We're not going to talk about drug policy, HIV and AIDS, hepatitis B, pump in more money mm. into it in that into that sector yeah. bring in more medication for more people who have been infected as, as a result of PWIDs. Yeah. so we need to manage it together that's why we have the virtual means mm. when you talk about COVID you, ha you, you take about 5 minutes or 10 minutes to educate people on HIV and AIDS educate people on other sectors of, of importance mm. but if you focus on just COVID we are just actually planting seed for doom Let's look at the future of the network because the points that you have raised are very important for those who are watching from across the continent. That, okay, so here's Ghana doing this. Um, Ghana is also learning from other countries. You were saying earlier that yeah. Ghana is learning from Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone is focusing on Nigeria. On, on Nigeria. They're looking at harm reduction, yeah. which is something Ghana needs to learn from. So best practices is an important thing that needs to happen. Nonetheless, West Africa is still leading on this yeah. discussion. So what is it for those, for the audience out there that is not West African, what do they need, would you like to give them as a takeaway on what they need to do in their uh, regions to pick up this whole advocacy on drug policy reform? Okay, so first of all, we mm. need to understand, yeah. educate ourselves yeah. on drugs and drug policies. Mm -hmm. We need to first of all understand people, understand why people do the things they do. 
we need to develop some passion towards it. Ghana is leading because we are passionate about it. Yes. We are very hell-bent on causing change and making mm. change. Yes. So I believe um, as we are learning from Nigeria, people can contact um, mm. the network here and learn from us, learn from how we're able to achieve what we've achieved for the past five years till now and still working hard to achieve even more. Yeah. Um, I believe they need to engage more with their stakeholders. They need to understand mm -hmm. how the criminal justice system is in their um, regions. Mm -hmm. Engage more lawyers, because on our network we have lawyers, we have mm -hmm. doctors. Yes. Um, so once you have the aspects on board, yes. you'll, be having, you, you'll be able to have a strong force. Mm -hmm. for yeah. Who will to, help carry yeah, the, who the have, issue. Um, yeah, you know, carry the, the issue mm -hmm. at the forefront because yeah. when we, we, you call a doctor, there's a doctor to talk. When yeah. you call a lawyer, there's a lawyer to talk. When you call um, a young person, there's a young person to, 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 to talk yeah. on behalf of the young people in the country. Yeah. So they need to structure um, their um, advocacy system very well, mm -hmm. um, get everybody involved in the discussion. Um, have a lot of stakeholders meetings, stakeholders mm -hmm. dialogue, youth engagement, which is very important. Mm. And that, that is one credit I'll give to the West African Drug Policy Network. Yeah. When they started, they added young people to it, mm -hmm. added someone in the media, which was you. We mm. added someone in other civil society mm. organizations to it. We had Maria, who is a lawyer. Mm -hmm. We had Adamu working actively towards um, um, harm reduction, harm reduction yeah. and community and um, mm. the reduction of community spread to as well. Mm. So they should come together. It's a mm. collective effort. Yeah. You know, so they should come together, mm. work as a team, mm. work towards achieving that and, and engage their stakeholders more in the media. Mm. It's a powerful tool. Mm. The media is what we used in, um, in sending our messages across. Yeah. So they should engage the media more, get the media to be part of the network yes. and engage people through the media, mm -hmm. you know. I believe they'll be able to achieve that because like you rightly said, we are even looking forward to mm. changing the narrative as far as harm reduction is concerned. Mm. It will be a great joy. Yeah. We'll jubilate over it if government says, oh, we've, 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 accepted. we've, we've accepted harm reduction yeah. in Ghana. We'll all be happy about it because it will help reduce the spread of HIV and AIDS, hepatitis B and other um, diseases and even COVID. Mm -hmm. and, and in the wrap-up, whilst we're on, on, on COVID, as we're winding down, um, a lot of organizations that were normally not dealing with COVID now have uh, a COVID liaison mm -hmm. to be able to still interface with their normal work and COVID. Um, would the policy network consider uh, having a liaison person who is working on COVID who can interface with the rest of the world on why Though COVID is important, we still need to focus on the points that you raised, cancer, HIV, and hepatitis. Would the network consider that? Oh, yeah, they are. Okay. Yeah, and I, I, I know at least uh, two or three people. Mm. Maria is doing that. Okay. I'm doing that. The other people also doing that on their own. But okay. yes, we are considering doing that, you okay. know, because we actively talk about COVID. Mm. Um, the network doesn't focus basically on drug policy. But anything that is, you know, in connection with drug policy, yes. we pick it up. Mm -hmm. So we are considering, you know, having um, some um, sort of structure in place to mm -hmm. talk about COVID to, and then link it to drug policy mm -hmm. and have ways by which we can create a mm -hmm. balance mm -hmm. in the discussion going mm -hmm. forward. So it's in the pipeline. I'm sure Maria has um, some things planned. We have a new focal person doing extremely well okay. with the network. Um, so yes, we, we have some um, measures yes, put in place. For right. Great. That. And finally, in uh, what would be your takeaway to everybody in Ghana and across the continent on why this network is important and how, how it's been able to manage this for the f past five years? Okay. So the mm. network opened my eyes to so many things. Yeah. Um, through the network, I, I, you know, I challenged myself to go study psychology mm. that I have completed now. Yeah, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. To be able to reach out to more people, yeah. change the mindset of people. Um, I was telling someone that it's only a fool who doesn't change his decisions yes. in life. Yes. Um, agreed. Mm. There's been a uh, spikes in criminal cases. There's been spikes in the uh, health cases mm -hmm. um, 
there's been spikes in so many things yes. linking to drug, drug and drug policy. Yes. But I believe that as young people, as citizens of Africa, mm. it is our responsibility mm -hmm. to cause or to, to create change mm. in our lives for the generations to come to benefit from it. Yes. And we are not going to create the change you know, maybe years to come, it's now. We need mm. to start now. Mm. We need to create the change. So we need to come back to the drawing board yeah. and look at what will work and what will not work. Yeah. We've had policies. Let's go back to the drawing board and ask ourselves, has those policies benefited us in any way? Has mm. it worked in any way? Yeah. Then we'll look at, you know, what we need to take out of those policies and what we need to add on to the, 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 the old policies to create a new policy, you know, just to be able to change yes. our way of thinking and our way of living. Mm. Mind you, we can save millions of people if we come together yes. and change our mindset towards yes. drug policy. Yes. I always say Kofi Annan did great, mm. you know, by picking drug policy up. Unfortunately, he couldn't, you know, he couldn't live and it's take it there. So yeah. just as he, he always say, drugs have harmed many. And I love that quote, but our bad policies have harmed many more. So let's go back to our bad policies. Let's restructure it, mm -hmm. make it a good one. Yes, so on that note, um, I guess you heard it all from Joanna's uh, own mouth. Let's get back to the bad policies. Let's take a look at those bad policies and rejig it and see what we can do to get the Africa we want. And most importantly, the Africa health we want because at the end of the day, I think uh, the uh, Africa we want includes the recognition that we also need an African kind of health where we are doing great things like Joanna is doing with the network, uh, where Africans lead in the conversation on health-related issues. And to the extent that even West Africa is serving as a model for other regions. I, I understand a couple of uh, months ago, East Africans wanted to learn yeah. from West Africa West drug Africa. policy. Yeah. Uh, so we are making great strides. So we need to get to that stage where even as we talk agenda 2063 and the Africa we want, we're going to also look forward post-COVID to the African health we want. And we hope to see you there on that journey as well. Thank you for a great show. Thank you for giving us time. And we hope to speak to you on another very important topic next week. Have a great day. Goodbye.